turn and greet somebody around you. Did you turn them loose again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> There's always a risk when you turn everybody loose. It's, try to bring it back together here. But it's good to, uh, <clears throat> just thinking, we need to do that every once in a while because some of you may not know the person sitting behind you. Or this person sitting, but it, we need to know one another. And so today's the time of fellowship. We're going to have a meal together and enjoy each other's company and, and just enjoy the Lord. So, uh, <clears throat> kind of a, what, what's kind of going to happen today? You know, it's like you, you try to f- formulate what, what it's kind of happening and you hope it goes that way. Uh, so we're going to uh, do the message and stuff. And then we'll go into our, our worship time. And, <clears throat> and what we're, I want the, the ministry team to come up during worship time. Because generally we go a few, a few songs and then we do... But we want to make sure anybody needs ministry can get ministry this morning. And then we're going to uh, go through the worship that Dan has set. They're gonna, Dan and Linda are going to leave early. They brought their truck. They're going to go get the chow. And so they're going to leave about... Uh, quarter after 11 to go over and pick it up at Dickie's and um, and so uh, so when we're through with worship because we're going to continue worshiping for a while until while they go so it's on autopilot Uh, (laughs) and then uh, then we'll just uh, Kevin and the guys will bring it down just some background music and we're going to set up tables in here so we need all hands on deck, moving chairs and setting up tables. And we want to, this is a formal family appreciation. You know, we, it's special. It's a special time for us to have a feast together after uh, summer and all this stuff. So, and we just want, want you to know we love you. And churches don't function without everyone being a part of it. And we're, because we're a family. The family of God coming together, and so I appreciate every one of you that, that's that's here today, and there may be some more coming, and so this is a, a great day. So, so let's get into God's word. Well, God's good. It's it's so cool what God is doing in our lives. If we truly understand what it is to be a child of God and coming into the fullness of that, oh, I got to do something here before it bothers me. Public and party, they were here this week and they put the pulpit too far forward, and this is my walkway. <laughs> so, <laughs> but being a family of God, we come in together and Growing together. And my heart is, <clears throat> I don't want to pastor a church of sheep. I want to pastor a church of warriors, of shepherds. Now, I'm not saying you're going to pastor a church, but warriors, guardians, watching, that we become what we, we talked about last week is... Uh, the, the title of the message today is Laying Hold of Our Sonship. Coming into our sonship, who we really are in Christ. And that's the thing that kind of um, has filled my heart over the years is a concern, do people really know who they are in Christ? Because if you knew who you were in Christ, um, the enemy would not have his way with us. 
And so our ignorance is his advantage. And so my heart as a shepherd is to remove the ignorance or minimize the ignorance of who we really are in Christ. Yes, I'm a Christian, but I'm more than a Christian. Yes, I attend church, but it's more than I attend church. I am the church. You are the church. And that's where we have to come into that concept of who we really are in Christ. And if we don't know that we're sons, sons of God, not, not the Son of God, but we are sons of God, and we'll get into this. Because last week we talked about we are kings and priests unto God. Kings rule, priests minister. Kings rule in the earth and kings minister, and priests minister. In Revelation, it's a few scriptures we used last week, Revelations 5, 9, and 10. <clears throat> you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. Are we reigning on the earth? Some of us are. But I think but the, church, the world would be a lot different place if, if the body of Christ knew who we really are. As priests, we are ministers to God. And as kings, we are ministers to the world. As <clears throat> ministers, kings... Priests are ministers to God, and kings are rulers on the earth. It's 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. See, he's speaking to us, and he's telling us that we, you and I, are a royal priesthood. A holy nation. We are a nation in this world. The body of Christ around the world is a separate nation from the nations of the world. His special people, that you may proclaim the, the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people. See, if you're out there, you're not a people. You're not, you're not the people of God. But are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We are sons of God, as priests would be to the son of a king. Our adversary is scared to death that we will come into an understanding of who we really are. As long as we don't understand who we are, he rules. But when we, the body of Christ, understand who we are, what we are becoming, he's scared to death of us. Who are, who are we? And take up our rightful role and authority over his kingdom. Because we can rule over his kingdom. The king will delegate to his sons to rule over parts of his kingdom. Uh, it was uh, Miles Monroe, I think it was. Because he was, I think he passed away in a wreck, but he, he was, he had uh, down in the, the islands off of the Florida, Bahamas. He was in the Bahamas, had church down there, and ministry down there and stuff, and which was an uh, English colony. So they understood kings. And who the king sets up over a territory, that person is king of that territory. When the big king, the father, comes to that place, he becomes a prince, and the father usurps his authority as king over all. So we are kings in the earth, ruling and reigning with Christ, the Holy Spirit. When Jesus comes back, he assumes his kingship over us. 
and over all of the earth. I hope that's not too confusing. But it's understanding that there is a hierarchy that we has been delegated to us by our Father in heaven. That we are to rule and reign in the earth. The king will delegate to his sons to rule over parts of his kingdom. Our Father, our Lord and King, is equipping us, his sons and daughters, to rule over all the forces of darkness. We are of a royal family and are being equipped to take our dominion over darkness. That's what I believe the church has really been missing, is who we really are. We are more than just attenders, waiting for Jesus to come back. Some people feel called and they move into the ministry, but most of, all of us are called. Whatever you do, Whatever business you're associated with, whatever job you have on that job, you are a representative of the King Most High. You are always a representative of our Lord God because you're His son, you're His daughter. I should say, we're all sons of God. There's no gender. When we're calling sons of God, we're all sons of God. Ladies, you can be sons just as I can be a bride. I'm happy to be the bride of Christ. So it's not a gender thing. We are a royal family and are being equipped to take our dominion over darkness. That's the enemy. That's who we rule over is darkness. We don't rule over people. We don't set up a religion to rule over people and tell you me to dictate to you how you live your life, what you do. That's, in the past, was called heavy shepherding. And it's an it's a evil that the, where the, the enemy comes into the church, comes into leadership, and usurps an authority that wasn't given to them by God, but is given to them by the devil to rule over people's lives. Back, this was probably 70s and 80s, the heavy shepherding movement. You couldn't buy a car unless you got approval of the pastor and the eldership. You couldn't buy a house. You, had, you couldn't do anything. You had to get approval. And approve, and approve that uh, you're know, making sure your tithes and offerings are coming in. That was heavy shepherding. It was evil. And that's what the devil wants to do is enter into the church and pervert it. Pervert it so the church never becomes what she's destined to be. In Philippians 3, 12 through 14, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. This is Paul speaking. He hasn't, he, if anybody, he should have obtained, but he was still pressing in. His whole life on this earth is pressing in. Press it in. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, my old life, my old past, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal, the prize, the upper calling in Christ Jesus. That should be every one of our hearts is pressing into God. Pressing into what, Lord, you've called me to be. Whatever... Wherever you are, whatever you do, where, Lord, where in this business, this, is, this job, whatever, in school, whatever, Lord, use me. I am here to be used. Use me. Laying hold comes from the word cat, catla umbano, is to take eagerly, to seize, possess, apprehend, or attain. So this means that I am reaching in to obtain it. I am pressing into God with all my heart, all my soul. I want to be what Christ has created me to be. What the Holy Spirit is inside of me. I want it. I want it for all of us. There is an overcoming remnant that has and is pressing their way to the mountain, top of Mount Zion. There are people that are pressing in. Pressing in. 
These men and women are partakers of a divine nature that we've been talking about. Here, here in Second Peter, he talks about, by, by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of a divine nature. Why would Peter say that if it wasn't possible? Why would he lie to us? He's not lying. He's speaking by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit says you are partakers of a divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So what is the purpose for us to be partakers of this divine nature? So we can sit around and wait for Jesus to come back? And just sing and worship, which is great. But is that what it's about? It just... We gather together inside the four walls of the church. We're safe in here. And we will just exalt the Lord and lift the Lord up. And we will pat each other on the back. We have made it. Is that what it's all about? How boring. We're here for a purpose. It's for out there. Our families, our friends, our neighbors, our loved ones out there. That we come together and we get built up by the Holy Spirit and encouraged by the Holy Spirit that, yes, I can do it. It's like the locker room before you go out on a football field. Today, the Seahawks start off. They're probably already over there in the locker room and they're just pumping each other up and slamming each other. Man, we're going to kill them today. That's what we should be doing when we come together at church. We're going to kick the devil's rear end this week. We're going to do it. We're going to save some people. We're going to get some people set free. We're going to do it. Yeah! And after churches, we run out the door. Yeah! They just released the heaven and the earth. Here we come. Watch out, devil. I need to be a little more subdued. So what is the purpose of the partaking of our divine nature? So that we will be like the sons of Issachar. In 1 Chronicles 12, 32, the, the children of Issachar, who had an understanding of their times to know what Israel ought to do. Their chiefs were 200, and all their brethren were at their command. They knew what they were supposed to do. And they were feared and revered. That's what breaks my heart about the church. The condition of the church. I just see more and more statistics that the church has been on a major decline. Well, those miracles, they don't work today. We're living in the seventh day of creation. We're living in the third watch of the church. We're in the final hours before the return of Christ. But folks, we have work to do. This, this, is, this is our our work. We have to get busy. The church is and has been blind to who she really is. That's why the church has been declining. Do you believe that if people were seeing signs and wonders and miracles and people getting healed and delivered and set free, people's lives have been totally changed and transformed, that people would be walking away? That's what the early church was doing, the first church. And they didn't care if, if they got killed in the lion's den. I'm sure they didn't like going in the lion's den. But in the midst of that, they're still proclaiming the gospel. I will not give up. I will not surrender. But today we're surrendering. Well, I don't, I don't believe that Christian stuff. I, that's all fairy tale. The church is and has been blind to who she is. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are establishing his kingdom in the church. The church, the ecclesia, are the called out or the assembly of believers. We are the ecclesia. 
because we have assembled here. In John 18, 36, and John answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would give up, surrender, fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not here. It wasn't time to fight then. But it's time to fight now. And not fight just to exist. Fight to save souls. Fight to expand the kingdom of God. Fight against the forces of darkness. That's what we're here for. The kingdom of God is the realm within which the will of God is carried out without any, any interference. The church is ordained <coughs> to be in the realm within God's authority where... Uh, within God's authority is exercised. God's authority flowing through the church to this world. There's four principles here. The foundation of the kingdom is I must be after God's heart. Next slide. I must be must be the desire of my heart is I want your heart, God. It's one thing to be motivated by intellect, but what's totally different when you're motivated by your heart. That when you're in a time of prayer or you're just driving down the road and something comes over you and you feel in your heart, I need to talk to so-and-so. I need to do, I need to go somewhere. And feel that unction in your heart. That's the Holy Spirit. It's where the Holy Spirit, whenever He talks to me, I hear it right here. Not here, here. And so, we must be after God's heart. I want your heart. I want your heart for me. I want it for my family. I want it for my church. I want it for my community. The next one is the character of the kingdom is obedience. When you hear it, you respond to it. When the Holy Spirit says go, go. Don't try to negotiate. Just go in blind obedience. As most of you, most of you probably know, and I know some of you say you get tired of hearing my stories, but I built a, a house for my family in Finley. We bought, after we got married, we bought an acre and a quarter. We moved a single white on there, and then just before Gabe was born, our son, I built an addition onto it with plan of building the rest of the house. And it was uh, early 90s. I got laid off at uh, Chevron because Unical or another company come in, bought them out. And I was just ready to build the house. And so we went to the bank and the most they would loan us was $50,000 to build our house. And that meant I had to do everything. I couldn't hire anything done except having the AC guy come out and charge the system. I built this house for my family because we were going to retire there. And uh, that was in the early, early 90s. I took two, two years sabbatical from the church because I had, I had to work other jobs, but I had to uh, be out there working. And so we, we got the house done and lived in it two, I don't know, two, three years. And I was praying, it, it's a long story, but my best friend died. I went through a dark night of the soul, searching, Lord, what do you want for us? Where, do you want, what's, where are we going? I, I, I feel lost. And I was praying in my office. I, at that moment, I said, I, I'll go to Africa if you want me to go to Africa. There has to be something change. And I got through praying and heard the Yakima go through my mind. I went and told Shirley, I said, what do you think about going to Yakima? Yakima? What's in Yakima? We sold a house that I built for my family that we were going to retire in 
because God was more important in that house. And many of you know that when we were up there, up there about seven years, and Pastor Roy asked us, I would pray about coming back. We loved it up here. We had our second house, just remodeled it. We lived out in the country, had an acre and a quarter. We had a creek running through the back of it. It was, it was like paradise. Why would I want to come back to the Tri-Cities? And I made the mistake, I prayed. <laughs> I said, Lord, what do you want us to do? You got to go home back and take care of your family. That's how I see you. I'm not here to be a pastor. I'm here to be a brother and to love my family. And I praise God our family is growing. And you guys are not on a list. You're in here. You're, you're in our heart. And those sacrifices we made, I know, God, you have a greater purpose, a greater calling in our life that I will lay anything down, even my life, to pursue what you want for us. Because this is not our resting place. This is our testing place. Eternity, we'll go to rest with the Lord. But I believe we're going to be really busy up there. We're not going to just float around and play harps. God is a creator. Now, <clears throat> let me say this is something that has been churning in my spirit. Can I do doctrinally lay this out? Can I? This is just a feeling. When I'm looking to eternity, what eternity will be. God created us to rule and reign with Him. He created us. His special people that are called out of darkness into the marvelous light. And as I've, this, this might hope is something too deep. He had a part of his kingdom, Lucifer fell, took a third of the angels with him. He created man to be tested and to go through that test by choice to serve God and gone through the hardships and all of the garbage and the crap this world feeds out but trust God with all our heart all our soul all our mind so that when we go to eternity and be wed with Christ the sons of God we will be a part of the family of God and we will be a pest. All the people that have accepted Jesus Christ throughout eternity have been tested against evil. And we did not falter. And because we did not falter, He will be able to use us in advancement of whatever God has for eternity. But he's, because He knows He has a people that have been tested with evil and did not falter. This is not just about making it to heaven. And what I'm sharing with you is not just about making it to heaven. There's something greater out there in heaven. There is the eternity out there with God. And we are a special people. We are the bride of Christ. My wife has is just a, a, everything that I have is hers. And everything she has is mine. <coughs> what does it mean that we are the bride of Christ? And we're going to be married to Him. No one else in creation is married to God. Except us who have chose him over evil and willing to lay our lives down and die in the lion's den or whatever comes our way, we will not compromise, we will not capitulate, we are his for eternity. 
So God will be able to trust us for eternity. And whatever he has for us out there is going to be so glorious. And the relationship that we have with Jesus for eternity is going to be on anything that we'll ever imagine here. But I guess the essence of what I'm saying here is that I lost my tablet. Praise the Lord. Is that we are created and we're going through a process of growing and maturing in God. That we have our eyes on Him and not on the world. Not on what people say, not on the news media, whatever happens out there, our eyes are on Him and Him alone. It's Jesus in there. My kingdom is not of this world. This is not the kingdom. This, the kingdom is going to be out there. It's not of this world. My kingdom is where... <clears throat> if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. The kingdom of God is the realm within which the will of God is carried out without interference. The church is ordained to be in the, in the realm within God's authority to exercise His will. <clears throat> the foundation of the kingdom, I must be after God's heart. The character kingdom is in obedience. I walk in obedience to Him. You say it, I'm going to do it. Even a great sacrifice, selling our home twice. Lord, I want to be in Your will. Because if I'm in your will, I know you'll take care of all my needs according to your riches and glory. I want my will to be conformed to your will. The principle of the kingdom. God exalts those who humble themselves. If you want to be great in the kingdom, humble yourself. That's why I say I'm, I'm just a brother. Somebody said, well, you're, you're the pastor, you're, you're special. You can think that, but I think I'm a nobody. Because I don't want in my own mind to think I've, been, I've become somebody. Look how great I am. Because that has brought many ministries down. I am nothing except what you make me, God. It's all in your hands. The principle of the kingdom is God exalts those humble themselves. Evidence of the kingdom are the manifestations. The manifestations of God touching our lives. The manifestation of the glory of God moving in our lives. <clears throat> Matthew 11, 1 through 6. Now, it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach to preach in the cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Jesus, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Are you the coming one, or should we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go tell John the things which you hear and see. Hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What's the evidence that God's in the house? The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. That's the evidence of the kingdom. Not how great my preaching is. It's not about me. It's about God moving through. If I am successful in what He has called me to do, you will be moving in signs and wonders and miracles. I would like to do one once in a while. Ephesians. It's called some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for 
the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the, to the measure and stature and fullness of Christ. So what's my job is to equip you for the work of the ministry. Oh, here's my, my sister needs to be healed. We've got to get it to the pastor. Well, yeah, I'll pray. But you do it. The same spirit that's in me is in you. If I'm doing my job right, you'll pray. Let's pray right now. Let's pray. Let's get the oil. Honey, get the oil. Let's pray. I've been a part of church in the past where we've got to call the elders. There are special times you call for the elders. It, it, it has it listed there. But I believe 99% of the time, we could do it. All of us could do it. We are coming into a clashing of two kingdoms, and it's going to be violent. We can see what's going on in our nation. We can see what's going on in the world. Darkness is rising. And the clash of the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness is going to take place. Matthew 12, 11, 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until the kingdom of heaven, <clears> the <throat> kingdom of heaven suffereth violent, and the violent take it by force. Who is this great kingdom, a great conflict of kingdom with? Matthew 16. And I also say unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell is the enemy. Will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's all of us can bind and loose. Why? Because we're the sons of God. <coughs> in the clash of kingdom, kingdoms, God has given us authority, authority which is symbolic of keys. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm glad I'm so proper and <laughs> refined. <laughs> Through the revelation of Christ, we become sons with authority to prevail over hell. We have authority over hell. The only reason why we don't is because we have not been taught and have not accepted that authority. <clears throat> question is, is are you a, chi a child of God? Well, children don't fight wars. We come in as children. That was kind of a trick question. We come in as children, but the idea is not to stay children. It's to grow in our faith. Grow in our authority, grow in our understanding of who we really are in Christ so that we can take authority over situations. Things arise in our family. We don't have to wait two days to get the pastor to come over. We'll take care of it right now because I know the authority that's instilled in me by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is inside of me. I can fast and pray for my family. I can intercede and pray for my family. We have been given power in faith to speak to mountains. In Matthew 21, so Jesus answered and said, And surely I say unto you, uh, if, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, Be removed and cast in the sea, it will be done. And whatever thing you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Was Jesus lying there? Or was he speaking a fact of truth? And whatever you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. 
How many times do we pray waiting to see what will happen? Well, let's pray and see what happens. Are we approaching it with the right attitude of heart? As we pray, let's kick this out. Let's deal with this right now. We should know when we pray what will happen. That God is going to move, the Holy Spirit is going to move and touch this person's life. If Mount Rainier was to blow up tomorrow, Lord, in the name of Jesus, cast it into the sea. This was years ago. Pastor Larry Lee was in tech, uh, Texas. He was building, they were building a brand new sanctuary. They had the land all level. They were pouring the concrete slab for their, their new facility. <clears throat> and a Texas thunderstorm was coming right at him. Right at him. Pastor, what are we going to do? We got all this fresh concrete out there. He walked to the edge of the property. In the name of Jesus, storm part. And the storm split and went right around the property. It was raining on both sides of them, but where the property was, it did not rain. Well, I can't do that. Yeah, with that attitude of heart, you can't do that. But see, the Lord wants us to grow in the attitude of our heart is, I can do that. You ever seen a little kid growing up, and we all had kids, and see. I want to do it, Papa. I want to do it. Let me do it. Let me do it. That's the way we should be. Lord, I saw you do it. Let me do it. I want to do it. As sons, God has given us authority to command the works of his hand. In Isaiah 45, 11, Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his Maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the works of my hand. Command me. Works. A work, a deed, a doing, a thing done. Hand, strength, power. Command to give charge to, to give command to. So what God has done here is, the Lord has done in Isaiah, He has commissioned us to command the works of His hand. We're not commanding God, the works of His hand. That we know the heart of God to save people, to set people free. I command the works of it, uh, the hand of Jesus. I don't have to say that, but I, I, what I'm saying is when I cast you out, devil, in the name of Jesus. What have I just done? I commanded the work of His hand. Be thou bound, Satan. I'm commanding the works of his hand. Job 22, 28. You will also decree a thing, and it will be established for you, so light will shine on your way. Decree a thing. We will be prosperous. When COVID hit and churches were shutting down, I should agree, we're going to go through this in the name of Jesus and we're not going to feel anything. You know what? We went through it. Our finances stayed there. Everything was... And back that time, we were, we were not as many people as we have here right now. And actually, God brought in more finances than we needed. He has provided for us every year because we stand up and believe that God, you have established His here and you are going to use us. And so if you establish this here, you will provide for us. Lord, you've called me to do this. You will provide for me. You called this body together. You will provide for us. Whatever we have need of, you will provide for us. That we walk in that attitude that, God, you will provide. Well, what happens if, we're, if the power goes out? Or what happens if the stores or trucks don't, can't drive anymore because diesel price is so high? and all this, We could go down all these roads. God, you're going to provide for us even if we have to eat out of a, a manna from heaven. 
As long as we're here, Lord, you're going to provide for us. And I know I could fast a few more days with no problem at all. <laughs> Jesus spoke the word only and gave command, and it was done. He made a decree. In Matthew 5, a centurion said to him, But only speak a word, and my servant will be healed. Jesus said, I have not seen such faith in all of Israel. A centurion understood that Jesus, all he had to do was command a word. And his story, he, who knew authority? And so he knew who was in charge, Jesus was, so just command the word. Acts 3, verse 6. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, <coughs> I do not have. But what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. When we speak believing, we receive. The lesson we learn is the incredible power of believing prayer. Authoritatively spoken and according to the will of God. Oh God, we're praying. We're begging you, please heal Aunt Lily. Oh God, if you will. Is that the way we're taught to pray? Our Lord, we come before you and we just lift Aunt Lily up to you right now. And we just declare by the power of your Holy Spirit, you flow in and you touch her, restore, heal, deliver, whatever Aunt Lily needs. We walk with an attitude of confidence of who we really are. <clears throat> the less so lesson we learn is the incredible power of believing prayer, authoritatively spoken. We're just about done here. Mark 16, verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they will, they will cast out devils, they will speak in new tongues, they will take up serpents. And that's not just, that's demonic serpents that are in people. So if you have somebody coming to at you who is a part of a cult, demonic activity, think they have power over us, most of them realize they don't, so they won't come around us, but if someone does, stop in the name of Jesus and they will have to freeze. They will take up serpents, and if they drink and live anything, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord's work, working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying of signs. Amen. It is not hard to do God's will. The power is in the name of Jesus. This is the church coming into full power of recognizing who we are and exegeting the, the authority that's been given to us. The church is the bride of Christ. We've talked about that in the past. It is about time that we start acting like the bride of Christ. And not just believers that are sitting around hoping that we can hang on until Jesus gets back. There's something, they're not going to kill us, or they're not going to. If they do, you go to heaven. But we're executing the will of the Father, not for my benefit but for their benefit. For the people out there that we know, loved ones that we know, people in the street, people out in the community that we run across in our jobs and our businesses, whatever we do, we are there for them. To share with them. Here's a word that the Lord gave me a couple nights ago. The Holy Spirit is in the process of building spiritual strongholds in your life. We talk about dark strongholds, but the Holy Spirit is building spiritual strongholds in your life. 
<clears throat> he must tear down ungodly strongholds in our life. That's the process that we go through, every one of us. Those old godly things that we've held on to and beliefs that we've had, those get tear, tore down and we rebuild the kingdom of God in our heart, the strongholds of God. So we, so we are, <clears throat> must tear down ungodly strongholds that work against you becoming who God has created you to be. Those, those things, if we hang on to those things, they will present, prevent us from coming into the fullness who Christ wants us to be. Unless, if they are not torn down, they will continue to work against your sonship and you will remain a child. The choice is ours. The choice is we, each one of us, move forward and say, Lord, I want to be a son. I want to be, I want to flow in the fullness of what you have destined for me. I don't want to play church. I want to be the church. I want to move out in the power of the authority. And I want to be able to pray and decree over my children and my grandchildren. I want to, I want to be able to move in the flower and power of and I want, to, I want to pray for us right now, but I want to pray for a release in our minds, in our minds and hearts, that the things that have, are past would be t- torn out of our minds and hearts that are not godly, because most of the warfare happens right here. We, if we win it here and get it down here, we will be big, victorious. Dan? So what we're going to do as I, as I close this here prayer, we'll go into worship. The ministry team can come up and we'll worship up here. If you need prayer, we want to pray over you. And so, <coughs> so if Dan leaves the stage in about 15 minutes or so, when they leave, don't worry about it. We'll just continue to worship. We'll continue to minister. The best ministry right now is between you and the Lord. Lord, open my heart. Reveal anything in my heart. Reveal any th- wicked way in me. If there's any th- thoughts that I've had that I've held on to that I, w- I need to get rid of, Lord, help me get rid of these. Lord, that I can walk into the fullness of what you have for me. Some, of the, some people that are, uh, you would think, the most feeble, older, an older lady that's feeble, can be the most powerful warrior in the kingdom of God. And they can set a thousand to flight by praying in their prayer room. God is going to move. So Lord, I, I just pray right now as we enter into this time of worship. Lord, I'm excited. Lord, that each one of us here are in different levels of, <coughs> of our maturity in you. Each one of us have, have gone through a lot of different things in life. A lot of failures, a lot of uh, successes, a lot of things that didn't work the way we thought. And Lord, all those things, Lord, that enemy uses as strongholds against us in our thinking that I can never do that, I can never be that. Lord, I pray right now as we get our time of worship, remove all those negative thoughts. Lord, this moment, right now, this this morning, you were resetting, rebooting our computer. Lord, I, I speak that over every one of us. Reboot our computer. This, our minds. Reboot our minds. Lord, all the antivirus viruses that have infiltrated our minds, those thoughts, those negative thoughts, those negative feelings, I can never do, I can never be, because of what happened maybe decades ago. Lord, I rebuke those thoughts. Those lies of the enemy, I rebuke them right now in Jesus' name. I pray that our minds be set clean and clear. Lord, our hearts will be set clean and clear. Lord, all the failures of the past, Lord, I pray right now they be washed out of our hearts. As we enter into this time of worship, wash us, overshadow us, clear, clean us out. Lord, this, this day is your day that you are doing a work in us. You are doing something in us. To bring us, bring us, every one of us, to a whole new dimension of our relationship with you, the relationship with the body of Christ, and how we see ourselves. 
Lord, I pray that as we come through this, Lord, we will see ourselves as who we really are, the sons of God. Lord, that you have set us here for a purpose. And Lord, we will fulfill that purpose. So Lord, we just enter in now with worship. We just enter in now, Lord, with the, the, with the open heart. Fill us, Lord. Fill us, Holy Spirit, as only you can. Fill, permeate through our hearts right now and do a work in us, every one of us, in Jesus' name. Amen. That's right.